Hello everyone, this is Chris from Pain and Glory and welcome to my video on how to paint World War I mid-late war German infantry in 28 millimeters. Before I begin, I really want to thank the guys over at Firelock Games, especially um, Rufus and also Mitch who worked on Blood and Valor for their shout out during the uh, Cyber Wars Q&A for Firelock. Um, I really appreciate uh, that. Uh, I really, really enjoy Blood and Valor, both as a game and also as a, a way of doing some exploration of the combat of World War I as a history teacher it really does get short shrift, especially in American history curriculums, kind of because of America's unique, not total lack of participation, but you know, significantly less than the European powers, obviously. Um, and maybe a video about the history of World War I and, and its historiography in America would be something interesting, but uh, for now, thank you very much for your mention. Um, back to the video at hand. Again, another painting video. I don't have any sort of video set up. This is literally, if you haven't figured out yet, Google Slides, and I'm narrating over it using a Zoom recording. So uh, bear with me. I am actually trying to get a video set up uh, so that I don't have to paint with one hand and hold my phone with the other, which it, it, I'm not sure how you're holding the mini then. Uh, but sooner or later, I will actually video record myself painting something eventually. Let's move on to it, shall we? Uh, World War One German uniforms. Uh, the German uniform didn't change that much over the course of the war. Um, as you can see, there were some changes, especially uh, the dropping of the pickle haube, which is, as a helmet, it's it's entirely decorative. Uh, I believe it was made of leather, and when leather was scarce, it was even made of a, a kind of like compressed cardboard sometimes. It is not really a helmet in the actual like protective sense. It was purely decorative. And thus once uh, people realized, you know, something metal on my head to keep me from getting killed by artillery shrapnel might be useful. And pretty much every uh, major power in World War I came to this realization independently. Uh, the pickle hub was dropped and replaced in uh, late, 1915, early 1916, with the stall helm, which you can see in the uh, on the belt of the 1916 example, and then on in the 17 and 18 examples of the uniforms. Uh, another big shift in the uniform that not just the Germans saw, but also a lot of the armies of World War One saw was due to material shortages. These these calf high, almost knee high leather boots that give you ankle support. Um, they couldn't really afford to put that much leather into them because they just didn't have that kind of material and they needed leather for a bunch of parts of the uniform, not just the boots. And so they switched to what you can see in the 1918 example there. It's a little hard to see there, these leg wraps known as putties or putties. Um, and they still, you wrap them around your ankles and your legs. It gives you some ankle support without you needing to wear these high boots. And so that was a switch over. In fact, those putties appeared on German uniforms even before 1918. It's just these particular models still have full boots on in 16 and 17. Other than those two things, the German uniform, it was tweaked a little bit here or there, uh, especially in some of the more decorative elements like the epaulets and on the uh, collars, uh, the more decorative elements of the collars were dropped over the course of the year uh, of the years. But for the most part, the German uniform, uh, the pants, the blouse, the uh, webbing, the equipment stayed mostly the same. And thus, it's pretty easy to from a painting point of view, to paint a early war, mid-war, or late war German infantryman uh, very similarly. Although we'll be focusing equipment-wise on the mid to late war with the leg wraps and the stall helm. Um, Color-wise, all of these uniforms are in what we would call Feldgrau or uh, field gray. It's this grayish, greenish uniform color that you've probably seen in photographs of World War II German uniforms. Although the uniforms themselves were, uh, well, different, but still similar, the colors were almost exactly the same. One of the other things you'll notice is that every single one of the uniforms in this picture is a different shade. Are they all field gray? Yes, they are, because there really is no one shade of field gray. It is this sort of desaturated grayish green color for which there is no real one official color to rule them all. Field gray is more of a spectrum of gray greens rather than a single dominating color choice. And that makes painting field gray really great because you can kind of use a lot of different colors without needing to go out and buy a specific paint. So let's move on and let's start with what are we going to be painting today? Well, we were going to be painting a what I believe is the only 
plastic World War I infantry, let alone World War I German, the only plastic World War I infantry manufactured in the entire world. And that is the World War I infantry by War Games Atlantic that you can see here on the right. And on the left, we have uh, what is actually an American reenactor of World War I Germans. And so we're going to be using him as kind of our comparison photo. Uh, so you can see if I am on track with my painting. Um, these, this kit is really great. It's got a lot of different uh, bits and bobs in there. So you can um, add extra grenades onto the belt. You can either give them or not give them the gas mask canister. Um, it's got a bunch of different weapon options. Obviously, it's got the rifle. It also has a couple of pistols. It's got hands holding grenades. It has um, the MG08 15, if I'm remembering it correctly, the light machine gun. Uh, really, the only weapons that this is, is missing is the flamethrower and then an actual like heavy machine gun team, which is well, it's just different than the actual like mobile infantry, so you hard to put in a kit there. Um, but in terms of infantry weapons, it's pretty much got everything covered. In terms of heads, you've got the Stahlhelm. That's what I've chosen to go with, just because it covers such a uh, wide swath of the war. But it, you can also choose the pickle haub. Uh, you can also go with the Stahlhelm with a gas mask, and finally, you can go with the the foraging cap, um, which was worn uh, kind of off duty. Uh, across the entire period of the war. In terms of primer, I'm going to go with a white primer. This is just a generic white Krylon spray. I bought it at Michael's for $5 or less. I really want to use a light primer because I want to try to keep the contrast high on this model. A model that is in almost entirely one color, and this model is going to be about 80% that field gray, and then maybe another 5 to 10% just a different shade of green, it can look really bland without a strong contrast. So we're going to need some very deep shadows. And that's easy to do with a wash, but we need some very strong highlights, right? Dark darks, bright brights. And this white primer is going to help us reinforce those bright brights, which are a little harder to get. The dark darks are going to be easy to get. You could also use a light gray if you have access to this. Uh, one other alternative you have, if you're not someone who really loves the painting side of the hobby and you're more of the gaming side of the hobby, you just want to get this stuff on the table as quickly as possible, you could go with what I have pictured here. It's a, You can get this at most hardware stores. Rust-Oleum Camouflage. This is the deep forest green color. And I have sprayed my... Um, machine gun team, my heavy machine gun team on the left, which are actually World War II German figures. I don't remember the manufacturer. Um, and what I've done is I have uh, kind of modified them and put the MG08 on there instead of what was originally, I think, an MG34. Um, I sprayed them in this Rust-Oleum uh, deep forest green, and then I just put a little skin tone on there. And then on the right, that's the model we're going to be painting with its field gray on it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And you can see it's pretty close. Right? It's a little darker. It is a little darker. You might want to go in there with some highlights, but or maybe some dry brushing very easily, but it's pretty close. And if you wanted to shave some time off of your painting, this could be a really good way of doing it. Um, also, in general, their camouflage line is just buttery smooth as a primer. And so um, sometimes I just get their camouflage line, the lighter colors, and I just use them as a primer anyway, uh, no matter what the color is, because they're just so good. But I, generally when I'm doing that, I want a lighter color than this dark green. All right, moving back onto our main guy. So we're going to start not with the uniform, but we're going to start with actually the face. And the reason for that is we're going to paint from the inside out. We want to start with some of the deepest parts of the model. And that in this case is the face because it's really going to be easy if we go in, let's say I didn't paint the face. Let's say I painted the helmet and the uniform first, and now I need to go in and paint the face. Well, I'm going to get flesh tone all over the collar, all over the helmet. I might touch it on that hel uh, on his rifle a little bit as I go on there. And so I want to make sure I get the deepest part, the flesh tones, covered first. Um, normally for kind of a medium Caucasian flesh tone, I use Army Painter's Barbarian Flesh. Now, when I did my World War I French video about a month ago, I used Barbarian Flesh for the French. You certainly could use the same skin tone for two different armies, but because I know these armies are going to be on the field at the same time, I want a little bit of difference between them, a little bit of variety. So I mixed Army Painter's Tan Flesh, which is their dark tan Caucasian skin tone, with the Barbarian Flesh, and thus that gave me a just a bit of a darker skin tone that'll look different from the French skin tone. 
if there's facial hair on their figure and some of the um, War Games Atlantic faces have some truly magnificent mustaches and mutton chops, uh, you can paint that with pretty much any old medium or dark brown or black or blonde if you want, although the blonde might stand not stand out that much. Um, so you could do that. This particular model does not have any facial hair. Um, and then finally, uh, while the paint on the face was drying, well, I went to a part of the model that was nowhere adjacent to the face, that is the boots, and I painted that with some Necromancer cloak. It's army painter, it's a very, very, very dark gray. It's not black though, and I tend to avoid pure blacks on my models because if I put a wash on a pure black, well, there's you can't get any darker. And so if I use a dark, dark gray, then the wash can still darken down that gray into an almost black while keeping the uh, more raised parts of it still the lighter gray. And that's why I tend to use this Necromancer cloak for. Uh, after this, we are going to move on to the actual uniform. I am using a Vallejo model color German field gray World War II for the step. This is all of uh, the jacket, uh, it was called the blouse, and also the pants. Um, this particular color, again, German field gray World War II, is supposed to be color matched for World War II German uniforms, which are pretty much the same color as the World War I German uniform. But as I said before, there were so many different kinds of German field gray in World War I and World War II, that really saying that this is the one absolute correct color is simply not true. I already had it from painting World War II Germans. I happen to like this color, but if you don't have access to this color, you just don't want to spend the money, try mixing a kind of a medium dark green and a medium gray paint until you find something that you're happy with, that kind of desaturated uh, grayish green color. You don't have to go with the quote unquote official color. Um, now, some other parts of the uniforms, like uh, the puttees, the leg wraps, I have seen photographs where those puttees are in uh, usually a different shade of green um, and usually a darker shade of green. So I went with a uh, Vallejo model color German camouflage dark green. It's from their World War II line. I just happen to like this dark green color. And then for the helmets, I have seen, even though the photograph, the reference photo I have on the screen is looks like it's pretty much the same field gray as the uniform, except painted instead of dyed. I have seen so many different colored German helmets in uh, photographs of reenactors, in photographs of uniforms and helmets in museums, in Osprey books. I've seen every conceivable shade of green, gray, gray, green, uh, just kind of steel. There's the camouflaged uh, helmets, which obviously would be a different topic. And so I wanted to go with a green that was not just field gray, so I had some more contrast in this. I also wanted a slightly lighter, slightly more saturated green, because a good way of adding interest to your your model is to have the lower part of the model darker, right? We have the darkest green on the bottom in the, in the leg wraps, then we have this medium green in most of the body, and then we have this light, all, not too bright, but brighter green up top, and that's going to draw your player's attention to the upper parts, the more interesting parts of the model, like the face. As humans, we are programmed to look at faces, and thus that's where we're going to look first, and that's where we want interesting colors. We don't want everything to be the same. Um, this particular color is Vallejo model color US dark green, but again, any kind of medium-ish darkish green would work here. Uh, you could even go with a gray if you wanted to. There's so many different options. Look around at some reference photos and, and make your own choice. This is the one I went with here. I think it's going to look good at the end. Um, after this, we got to do some of his equipment. Um, the Germans, their uh, weapon pouches and their belts, they would swap back and forth between brown and black leather. I happen to go with black leather here. Again, this is the second appearance of Vallejo. Uh, sorry, not Vallejo, Army Painter's Necromancer Cloak. It's also what the cover for the entrenching tool is painted. Um, and then as for the um, stick grenade, uh, well, the grenade part and also kind of the butt of the handle, those are in the same um, US dark green color as the helmet. The, the stick grenades tend to look very similar to the helmets in terms of colors. And then the wooden equipment uh, on the stick grenade and also on the rifle and on the handle of the entrenching tool. Um, I used a mix of Army Painter Monster Brown and Fur Brown just to give it a bit of a slightly reddish desaturated 
uh, light brown color. I also want to make this different from my French rifles, which I painted in pure fur brown. Again, I didn't want the German rifles to look exactly like the French rifles, hence a little bit of a mix uh, while I usually use fur brown. This is also a good point to, uh, place to point out that you might notice I have gotten um, some paint where it should not go. I've gotten a little green on the black parts. I've gotten a little black on the green parts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, don't worry too much about this at this point. We're going to have a cleanup step when all the base coats are over before we get to the wash where we kind of go back in with a tiny itty bitty brush and we clean up all those little mistakes there at the end. We got some more equipment that we got to do. Of course, I already mentioned the rifle is getting the same color as the wooden equipment uh, for the grenade and the entrenching tool. It's a mix of that monster brown and that fur brown. But then on the back, we've also got the German bread bag in possibly one of my favorite colors. I use it almost every chance I can get. That is Vallejo model color German camo beige. It is my favorite light khaki beige color. And then on top of that, uh, we have the canteen in just pure monster brown, a light brown. So that is a different color from the, from the wood because it is not wood. It is a, some kind of I believe it's some kind of cloth cover, although I could be wrong. Uh, this is another place where you want to go with the principle of painting from the inside out. The canteen is on top of the bread bag. So I want to make sure I paint the bread bag first and then paint the canteen. Because if I painted the canteen first, it's going to be very easy that when I'm trying to paint around the canteen uh, that I will get the beige color on the brown and then have to go back and fix it anyway. We have a little more equipment to go. We have got the leather um, strap on the rifle. I painted that in a slightly darker brown. I believe it's Army Painter's leather brown. Also, it's a little hard to see in the photograph, but this guy has a chin strap, the helmet chin strap going around his face. And so I painted that in also the same leather color as the rifle sling. Uh, going into the uh, back to the canteen, uh, that's the third and final appearance of Necromancer Cloak on the cap and also that ridge. I'm not 100% sure what that ridge is, but it seems to be maybe some kind of metal or some kind of um, cap strap that's holding it on there. Um, the gas mask canister, if you look in the photograph, it usually appears to be a field gray color but it's painted rather than the dyed fabric. So it looks a little different from the uniform. In order to try to represent that, what I did is I took my field gray color and I mixed it with Army Painter uniform gray, kind of a medium gray color there. Um, I think I may have been a little too subtle with this because it doesn't really look like it's that much of a different color. I'm not sure if it was really worth the effort to paint it a different color. Um, you can of course try uh, to tweak it a little bit if you would like it to be different or just leave it the same color as the uniform. That's totally fine. Um, and then finally, the um, metal on the rifle, I painted that in Army Painter Gun Metal, which is their dark metallic color. Um, if you don't have metallic paints or if you don't like metallic paints, you could also paint this in a dark gray, although maybe avoid necromancer cloak this time, just so your metal is going to look a little bit different than all of those brown leather details in this case. Um, now that we're done with all these base coats, we're going to go back and we're going to clean up any mistakes that we made. Um, like in this photograph, I can see underneath the gas mask strap, which I also painted as Vallejo's um, German camouflage beige. You can see some beige gone on the uniform there. So I'm going to go back in with my field gray, clean that up. A couple other areas you can probably see in this photograph that I'm going to go in and clean up before we move on to our next step. And our next step is actually something new for me. I did a test on, uh, not this model, but another one before this one to see if I like this. And what we're going to use for a wash is we're going to use not a store-bought wash. Uh, we're going to use a mix of store-bought washes. I discovered this on a blog, Allies uh, or Allies Toy Soldiers, uh, and it's titled, well, Allies Brown Liquid Wash. And what it is, is calling it a brown wash is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not like your Army Painter Strong Tone or your Agrax Earthshade by Games Workshop. Uh, it's not just a regular old brown. It is a mix that gives you a really interesting color. And let me tell you why I use this. In my previous painting of World War I and World War II Germans in 28 millimeter, I would use different washes for different areas of the model. I would use a black wash on the uh, gray, black, and green parts of the figure to really darken down that field gray. I would use a flesh wash on the flesh areas of the 
uh, model. And then I would use a brown wash, like an Army Painter Strong Tone or its Games Workshop equivalent, Agrax Earthshade, on the uh, khaki and brown parts of the rifle, like the like the uh, of the of the model, like the rifle. But especially on a model where there's so many different colors right next to each other, it's very easy to oh no, I got black wash on my uh, khaki colored bread bag and that that black on the kind of yellowish khaki looks terrible and then you got to go back in and fix it and then you got to put the brown wash on top of it and then you get brown wash on the uniform you got to go back and fix that but literally while I was painting these figures I found this blog post on Allie's toy soldiers about what he calls Allie's or she I'm not sure brown liquid wash and what it is is it's a mix it is now he used Games Workshop colors. I'm going to go with Army Painter colors because that's what I have. And I'm also going to include the link to the blog in the show notes so that you can see the um, combination he used. I did about 40% strong tone, Army Painter strong tone, which is a brown wash, 40% light tone, which is a bit of a sepia wash, 20% quick shade medium. It's just pigmentless wash medium. And that kind of uh, brings the the strength of the wash down a little bit. So right now you've got kind of a dark sepia or a very light brown wash, but the combination of strong tone and light tone gives you a very warm color. It's a little on the red side of the color spectrum. And so that's not gonna work very well with most of this model. So what really makes this wash special is there's a just, you added a couple drops of blue tone, of a blue wash. It kind of balances out the warm sepia a little bit, makes it not quite a cold tone on the blue side of the spectrum, but it makes it neutral. And that means you can kind of apply it to pretty much every single corner of this model. And I did, I applied it to every single corner of this model and it works really great everywhere. This is the first time I've used this wash. I used it subsequently on a uh, some World War II 15 millimeter figures, and it looks just as good on them. And that's especially important on smaller scales, where it's really hard to get different washes in different areas, um, where on 28 millimeters, that's possible. So I think this came out really great. And really, you could probably go to the table with this figure now if you were in a hurry or if you're just not someone who really is into the painting side of the hobby. Um, I would have made a couple of tweaks if I was just going to throw a wash on this and get it to the table, like maybe some dry brushing steps earlier on using a lighter skin tone. Um, but if you wanted to, you could throw this on the table right now. I am going to take a couple more steps and we can really punch this paint job up a little bit. So let's start doing some highlights first with the equipment. So the easiest thing is with the bread bag and with the strap for the gas mask mat, uh, container, we're going to take our original base color, the uh, German camo beige, and we're going to cover about 50 to 75 percent of that bread bag and the strap to uh, kind of bring it back to its original color while leaving the recesses dark. Then I'm going to go in with an even lighter beige. I used Army Painter Skeleton Bone, but any bone or light beige color would work. And I'm just going to kind of highlight along the edges to really bring that, that out. And I also, you can see, I kind of put in a fake shadow to differentiate kind of like the flap of the bread bag and then the main storage part of the bread bag uh, that wasn't quite sculpted in there on the side. Um, for the other part of the equipment that I'm going to highlight here, uh, I'm going to go in on the helmet and on the stick grenade with the original U.S. dark green base color. Now, for the stick grenade, that's pretty easy. You can just kind of highlight it. It's a cylinder, so you're going to do about one third of it down at the little base. That's also a green bit. You can do a little dab of, of the color there. Um, but for the helmet, I find it an easy way to, to um, highlight helmets because helmets are essentially spheres, at least the tops of them are. But highlighting a sphere is actually kind of difficult. Uh, you need a reference photos. It's pretty hard. It's not something I feel very comfortable with, but an easy way of highlighting a helmet so it looks like there's lighter colors on the top where the light is hitting it is to go in there and to do a method. It's not dry brushing. It's over brushing. It's almost like dry brushing. You take your original base color, the dark green color, the US dark green, and you put it on a dry brush, the kind of brush you would usually use for dry brushing. And then you're going to wipe some of it off on a piece of paper or a paper towel. Not all of it, most of it. It's still going to be just a little bit wet, not quite for dry brushing. And then you're going to start dry brushing the top one third of that helmet. And it's going to leave a kind of translucent layer of the base color 
So it looks like there's some very soft light highlighting the top part of that helmet while leaving the lower parts of the helmet as the darker green because of that wash, especially kind of the, the crevices in the helmets around where the, the metal bends near the lip. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to throw just a little bit of a lighter green color into my mix. And then I'm going to do that same thing in a very small circle around the top of the helmet that you could just barely see in that photograph. And that's really going to lighten up the helmet along the top. Uh, one other final step I'm going to do is I'm going to take Monster Brown and I'm just going to go back in and I'm going to highlight kind of the uh, top parts of my canteen. And that's pretty much it with the equipment. I'm not really going to touch the black leather parts of the equipment. I'm not really going to touch the wood. On the rifle, I am going to go in with fur brown and kind of highlight the edges a little bit later. But for the equipment, that's pretty much it. Now, with the skin, unfortunately, I did not take photos of the process by which I highlighted the skin. All I have is this final one, which you can see was a little further along because there's some other steps here that we haven't covered yet. Um, for the skin, what I did is I took the original Army Painter Barbarian Flesh. Actually, the original was a mix of Barbarian Flesh and Tan Flesh. But I'm just going to take Barbarian Flesh, and I'm going to go in, and I'm going to cover about 75, maybe 50% of the skin of the face and the hands. Um, all the raised parts, not the crevices, kind of bring this back to a flesh tone rather than this kind of dark leathery color that it is. We just want that dark leathery part in the recesses to simulate shadow, especially under the brim of the helmet. It's very dark in there. Then for the highlights, just the tops of the cheekbones, the nose, maybe the chin, the very, very ridges of the knuckles, I'm going to mix in a little bit of Vallejo Model Color Basic Skin. It's a very light skin tone, very light. I'm going to mix that into my Barbarian Flesh, and I'm just going to touch that in little circles in those areas that I just described. And while it looks very dramatic on the screen right now, if you walked away from your computer and so that that figure is about the same scale as a 28 millimeter figure, if you were looking at it from two feet away, it's going to look like, oh, I can see the facial features of this figure and it's not gonna look quite so dramatic when it's actually 28 millimeter scale and you're standing that far away from it. So finally, we need to move on to what is arguably really the most important part of this figure. And that is of course the uniform now, if I had used a black tone I for the wash, I would have started highlighting this with the base color. But because the deepest recesses are not as dark as if I had used a black, because I use kind of that dark sepia wash, I don't want to go in with just the regular field gray. It would be a very subtle transition from the shadows to the field gray. Now, if you're going for a very slow gradual transitions of the darkest shadows to the lightest highlights, go ahead and do that. But I have 33 models to paint and that would take me very, very long. This is not going to be a golden demon winner. This is going for like tabletop quality plus is what I'm aiming for. And so I just want to do two highlights. I'm going to take my original Vallejo Model Color Field Gray, and I'm just going to put a dab of another gray color, Vallejo Model Colors Gray Green. I don't want to just put white in there because that's going to brighten it up a little too much. I want to make it the same field gray color but just brighter, not any greener, not any grayer, just brighter. And I find this combination of field gray and gray green, both Vallejo colors, really just brings up the field gray without changing the tone of it too much. I'm going to go in and I'm going to paint maybe 50% of the exposed uniform, leaving the recesses in that darker wash down tone. And then after this, I'm going to go in one more time with that same mix, but now I'm going to mix it so it's roughly 50-50 field gray and gray green. And you really have to eyeball how bright this is. And I'm going to hit about maybe 15, 20% of the model, just the very edges of the folds of the uniform, where the knee, the height of the knee along the elbows, the cylinder of those cuffs there, um, along the ridges on the shoulders, just the very edges where you're going to be highlighting. And you can see that um, it really brings up the brightness of the model. Now, again, it might look very dramatic on your computer screen, but if you walk away a little bit and you look at it like it would look if it was a 20 millimeter fig and you were standing two or three feet away from it, it's going to let you see the outline of the model, the shadows and the highlights without it really being um, totally washed out by the fact that this is almost entirely a green model. We need these highlights. 
Um, you can also see during this process, while I was waiting for some of this stuff to dry, I went in, I painted my base. I used Vallejo model color flat earth, and then I washed that with Army Painter strong tone thinned with water. Um, that gives me a very churned up muddy texture uh, for like the trenches of the Western front. This is the exact same thing that I used for my French. I also rimmed the base in black, and I also went in and the basic infantry epaulette trim was white. So I went in there with just an ever so slight off-white. It's a little dingy, just a little um, on those epaulets. And we are done. And this is our final product. And I have also put him next to his lieutenant, uh, which I put a little bit of extra work in on, um, urging him forward for the glory of Germany and the Kaiser. So these highlights are really going to help this model stand up on the table where just it's a green model. It's probably going to be in a green table and it's just going to totally disappear. All right, we're not looking at bright yellow purple space marines here. We're looking at humans who are trying to blend in in their background and thus we maybe need to push the highlights a little bit so that they don't totally blend in in the background. Otherwise, it's going to be a little hard to see your figures. Um, and then finally, I got a couple more of his friends here that I painted up. Um, one with the sticker nade and a mustache. And then I especially like the one in the middle uh, with the glorious mustache and mutton chops there uh, combo. And then a couple of his other buddies uh, screaming. And otherwise, and you can really see the variety of poses that the War Games Atlantic figures really offer you. I appreciate everyone from watching. Uh, this is the end. Uh, if you have any questions, you can always leave a comment or reach out to me. Uh, I'm in the Blood and Valor Facebook group. You can also find me if you are a contributor to the Little Wars TV Patreon. I hang out on there. You can find me as CGRAU um, on the Little Wars Patreon, another excellent uh, wargaming channel if you are not already signed up. I hope everyone has a good night, a good weekend, and good luck with all of your painting and all of your gaming.